Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. When did Korea modernize? For many, the answer lies in the colonial era. While broadly accepted, this view is not without flaws or opponents. One of these critiques, Professor Kyung Moon Hwang, offers an alternative perspective. He argues that Korea's modernization is not just a result of Japanese influence. It was a rational process already started in the 19th century during the Choson dynasty by the government. To learn more about the modernization of the Korean Peninsula, we met with Professor Huang. He told us about the role the Choson administration played in this process, the pivotal nature of the Gabo reforms, as well as the different rationalities that directed the development of the Korean Peninsula before and during the colonial era. Kyung Moon Hwang is Professor of History and East Asian Languages and Cultures at the University of Southern California. He obtained his Bachelor in History from Oberlin College before pursuing graduate studies at Harvard University where he received his PhD in East Asian Languages and Civilizations. He is the author of Rationalizing Korea, The Rise of the Modern State, 1894-1945, and of A History of Korea, An Episodic Narrative. Professor Kyung Moon Hwang, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you, it's good to be here with you. How did you become interested in studying history, and especially Korean history? Well, I was a history major in college in, in the United States. Uh, I studied mostly European history, and in fact, I had a well-known professor of European medieval history uh, in Reformation studies as well. And, and so that was the focus of my studies in college. Uh, I wanted to continue with history studies, but I decided to change to Korean history Well, there are various, I guess, reasons. One being that I was interested, but I was completely ignorant about Korean history. There was also a matter of trying to be more practical about how I envisioned the connection between my studies and my career. And it seemed like that would be a field that would, in the future, blossom into something that demanded scholars. It'd be easier to get a job. You mentioned in the preface of your book that, and I quote, over the past two decades or so, it has become commonplace, at least outside of the peninsula, to associate Korean modernity mostly with Japanese colonial rule, especially considering the annexation of Korea by Japan in 1910. Why is that, and why do you disagree with this view? The growth of this notion of colonial modernity, which began in the 1990s, uh, was more or less a reaction against the overwhelming nationalist orientation of scholarship about modern Korean history. So it was a way to recover the colonial period from the perspective of the 1990s anyway, from the depths of uh, disregard and ignorance because of the nationalistic concerns that the colonial period should not in any way be given much credence as far as understanding modern Korean history was concerned. The problem is, from my perspective, and I came of age in, as a graduate student in that framework, this colonial modernity paradigm became so large and maybe even dominant, uh, at least in the United States anyway, that it came to be that, without necessarily explicitly saying so, the understanding was that the modern era was more or less equivalent to the initiation brought forth by the colonial system. Now, that could be an exaggeration, I suppose, and there obviously were research works that examine what happened before the colonial period and then after the colonial period as well. But it seemed as though, and based on various factors that are simple, went the other way a bit too much and uh, exaggerated the extent to which the colonial period itself was instrumental in bringing about the facets of the modern era that we're more familiar with. What I find in my work, and it wasn't just this book, but the work that I published before that, uh, that examined these um, groups of hereditary status groups from the late Joseon dynasty and how they became, uh, through various means, part of the emerging social elite uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century. So what I found from that research and from the research for this current book on the state is that while the processes of the modern era began far before the colonial period, um, it came to be that in the scholarship, the colonial period itself uh, was given much more credit and the earlier period and the earlier processes were in that sense overshadowed. And so what I argue is that if you're looking at something like the emergence of the modern state, you have to 
look at the the basis uh, of late Chosun Dynasty statecraft upon which the modern state emerged, and then you have to examine uh, all the different developments before the colonial period, which included extraordinary amounts of Japanese influence. But still, this is preceding the colonial takeover, and even before the protectorate period, that amounted to what we definitely can see as a departure from the late Joseon statecraft practices in institutions, in concepts, in ideologies uh, as well. And the most important moment in this was the Gaba reforms of 1894. There were reforms before then and certainly after that as well. But all in all, this amounts to a larger story of a longer process of modern change that began in the late 19th century that encompassed the pre-colonial as well as the colonial period. And it wasn't something that more or less you can reduce down to the major changes that the colonial period introduced. Before going any further, just a quick theoretical question. What did you understand as the core features of a modern state? Well, I didn't really have a strong notion of what a modern state constituted before I began this research. I had these more general ideas, uh, mostly from what picked up concerning Weberian theory, and of course, later on, the influence of Foucault. And so actually, both Weber and Foucault uh, play a large role in how I develop the ideas in this book as well. And Weber is mostly associated with uh, reducing, although that's a simplistic way of looking at it, equating a modern state with the authority to monopolize legitimate violence. Uh, and so this is a notion of a state that really is based on coercive force uh, and coercive powers, which seems to make a lot of sense. The thing is, of course, there are coercive states and systematized means of establishing legitimate violence or monopoly over legitimate violence in pre-modern states as well. Uh, but of course, Weber married these concepts with uh, what he sees as to be the rationalizing processes of modern administration in which uh, things are ordered, uh, regulated, uh, and crafted in a way and framed in a way that lead to a specific end through the most efficient means. And so... This is something that is really ingrained in the notion of bureaucracy or modern administrative practices in the state bureaucracy. But if you extend it further out uh, into different spheres of society, you can see that it can be applied to the larger processes of the emergence of the modern society uh, and economy as well. And that's really what Weber was concerned most with. And so that became clear too as I developed this research. And sure enough, the documents show you that this uh, goal-oriented rationality or spec rationalität, that's the uh, Weberian term, this goal rationality out of different kinds of rationalities, was the basis for much of the systematization and reforms of the modern state uh, in Korea, beginning in the pre-colonial period, but especially in the colonial period as well. Uh, and rationalization in that sense is really something that emerges in order to more effectively reach a certain goal. But the goals can change. And so you have rationalities in pre-modern states and early modern states as well as modern states. It's just the quantity and the means of extracting and mobilizing resources. They were all much greater than they were uh, in the pre-modern eras. And I'm talking here specifically about Korea, but it could be applied to other places as well. And of course, the influence of a monetary economy is important in terms of the extraction and use of material resources. And so that all gets to this notion of a state being more or less what we are familiar with when we talk about a modern state. That, I think, is understandable to arrive at some uh, a general understanding of, of state development in that way. Um, what I would emphasize is that not only in Korea, but especially in Korea and some other places as well, there was a very systematic and well-developed statecraft tradition uh, as well as state institutions and systematic means by which uh, state sovereignty was extended to beyond the central core, uh, even before the modern era. Um, and so I tried to deal with these apparent contradictions of, how, on the one hand, having clearly a pre-modern society and pre-modern state with a limited extractive capacity and a limited mobilization capacity on the one hand, but on the other hand, you have what seems to be very rationalized processes and rationalized institutions uh, on the other. How do you account for that uh, and still delineate what is modern about the state that emerged in the late 19th or and or the early 20th century? And so that is more or less the lar- one of the larger challenges of writing this book is to provide the specific details uh, behind what I argue for being 
the process by which a modern state emerged uh, in Korea in the early 20th century. But couldn't one argue that Chosun Korea already exhibits some of these characteristics of a modern state? I mean, after all, Chosun Korea boasted several centuries of governance and a fairly intricate system of administration. Yes, indeed, the Chosun state was in many ways modern, a modern state even in a Weberian sense. Weber laid out these characteristics of what he considered to be the modern state. I mean, it's very intricate, and I think it's not necessary to go into all those details. But if you look at the chosen state, it was systematized in a way that would have an extension of the central government into the provinces. Uh, and in the central government, you had this division of administrative responsibilities, much like what you have in modern states with the cabinet system, for example. And uh, you had these means of legitimating the state through the core values of Confucian philosophy and the Confucian ethics. So you had this comprehensive statecraft tradition established in the chosen state. The thing is, it was rationalized toward uh, achieving the realization of Confucian values. And so you had, for example, this very high standing of this one segment of administration called the Board of Rights, which you don't find in modern states. And the Board of Rights are responsible for everything from uh, education in the sense, not necessarily of what we're familiar with, but education for the sake of bureaucratic training, as well as education for the sake of cultivating uh, people to carry on their roles as uh, social elites, to overseeing the administration of the state examination system, to diplomacy. So all of those were under the responsibility of the Board of Rights. It's something that you don't find, of course, in the modern state, either in Korea or most other places as well. But on the other hand, the Chosun state had uh, rights, which I just mentioned, as well as personnel uh, administration. You had a separate board for public works. You had a separate board for uh, military administration, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so this systematic and rationalized uh, state administration system was very impressive to a, to, a, to a certain extent, particularly for a, an agrarian economy that established its own limits about the extent to which the economy would intrude upon these larger goals of uh, social and, uh, and cultural control. And so I think it's fascinating to consider that this basis was laid over hundreds of years in the Chosun era, in fact, even before the uh, Chosun era. Uh, and yet it still was, and perhaps this is understandable, it was insufficient to meet the sudden demands of statecraft in the mid to late 19th century when you had the intrusion of imperialist forces. And then so you get to the modern era, which we normally associate with this era of imperialism, or at least the beginning of the modern era, because this brought about this comprehensive, extraordinarily wide-ranging set of changes in the economy and society and in the state of administration. And, and state of administration took the lead in ushering in many of these changes. Uh, they all came together in a sense at the moment of the Kabul reforms, which did not, of course, implement all these extraordinary changes, but it did promulgate them. And that's really important in establishing the basis of the emergence of the modern state thereafter. Uh, and so thereafter, you have these incremental attempts to bring about greater state role in establishing regulatory authority over the ever-expanding economy and different social sectors associated with this increasing interaction with the larger world and the material changes that accompany that. And so it's in a way, it's, it's to chase after and gain a, a semblance of control over uh, these emerging sectors of society in the late 19th and early 20th century. And so you see, of course, changes in the state administration in terms of institutions but you also see changes in the way the state itself becomes a legitimized, legitimized in two senses. First, legitimized uh, as a state, in other words, to establish its authority. And secondly, to legitimize a particular state headed by sometimes different political actors, but sometimes even different sovereign holders, sovereignty holders as well. Uh, and so Korea, in that sense, was perhaps an outlier in the extent to which it had to undergo these rapid changes, much of which the Koreans did not control. And of course, they're talking about the era of imperialism, and this ultimately led to the Japanese takeover. Uh, and so the Japanese, when they come in, they have another set of goals, obviously. And so that brings about a different set of rationalities. And so uh, the whole book, in emphasizing this notion of rationality is really trying to problematize that notion of rationality as well, which we normally associate with the modern emergence of 
of logical means of ordering and understanding society, with the state playing a major role. This is the Weberian notion of it as well. But rationalities, like I said earlier, were inherent to the Joseon statecraft system. They were inherent to the pre-colonial reforms in the state. And then they were, of course, part of the Japanese uh, means of colonization as well. But even the colonial period, you had different sets of rationalities and changes in course uh, in the reforms of state administration, depending on whether you're talking about the early period of, of the colonial rule, or you're talking about the middle period, the so-called cultural period, or you're talking about, finally, the period of wartime mobilization beginning in the late 1930s to the mid-1940s. Each period had its own set of ultimate goals for political rule, and so that brought about a different set of rationalities as well as rationalizations, or in other words, legitimations. Uh, and so often these rationalities and rationalizations came in conflict with each other, or sometimes they appeared to be traditional, sometimes they even appeared to be irrational, right? irrational rationalities, if that's not itself somewhat of a contradiction, and of course it is, but if you think about it in terms of how efficiencies toward achieving a certain goal can emerge at different times for different purposes, then they can ultimately come to be seen as inefficient or maybe even irrational. And so you have these different forces tugging at the ever-growing realms of the state administration as time went by. And so the state did go along this path from the late 19th century to the mid 20th century of ever increasing size, ever increasing control, but it didn't necessarily go toward ever increasing rationalization or efficiency because often they were compromised by other goals of political rule. And so this is uh, something that I emphasize considerably in this book, that you have this clash of rationalities, even as rationalities emerge in establishing political role and further enhancing political role. And in the process, you have a means by which different social sectors themselves, such as education or religion or public health, come to take the shape that we're familiar with through their being the targets of state rational and rationalized control. And of course, in turn, the, those social sectors or the people in those social sectors react to the state overtures and the attempts at regulation. And so you, the state itself is really an outgrowth of this interaction between state attempts at regulation and on the other side, the adjustments and resistance that have to emerge based on the real life circumstances in which the state power is practiced. And so I suggest that in this book, you can't just look at state institutions when you are examining the development of the state. You have to look at how the state itself is a result of practices between state actors and non-state actors. And finally, how the state itself was an idea or a set of ideologies, perhaps, and symbols. Uh, and so I break down my book into the state as manifested in those three different ways. You mentioned the Gabo reforms, which took place in the summer of 1894. Uh, could you tell us very quickly about what they were? And should we see them as the state pushing for a new rationality, but being met with resistance from the society? Well, the Gabo reforms were, like other major reform movements throughout the Joseon era and throughout the Korean history, uh, they were attempts to implement a large-scale changes uh, in the state as well as in other social sectors as well. And so you're, lot, of course, going to invite a lot of resistance. Um, much of the resistance comes in the form of non-implementation or lack of implementation on the part of state actors, especially outside the capital. To outright resistance by different uh, social interests, uh, this is perfectly normal. But I think it doesn't take away from the significance of the copper reforms because it visualized and it promulgated, it articulated the systematic, comprehensive uh, set of reforms in the state, uh, in the economy, in the social structure, uh, in cultural forms uh, as well. And so at that time, people understood that these were not just another set of or another round of government reforms, that this was a monumental, very distinctive era that was being ushered in. And of course, that has a lot, probably a lot to do with the circumstances of the copper reforms. They were implemented not by the existing power holders as much as they were forced into the existing uh, central government by the circumstances of the Japanese military occupation of this capital city at that time. And the Japanese came in because the Chinese had come in. And the Chinese had come in earlier in the spring because the Korean government 
at that time needed Chinese assistance to put down the Kabo Tongak uprisings in the southwestern part of the country. And so you had a chain reaction, the first the Tongak uprisings, and then you have the uh, Japanese entrance, and then you have the Kabo reforms. But each of those three events led to extraordinary changes in Korea at the moment. And over the long term, they had this extraordinary influence uh, over Korean history thereafter. The Japanese entrance led to the war with China, which you know about, which ultimately, within a year, overturned the order of East Asia uh, that had been in existence for, what, 2,000 years, and which would stay in place until the most recent times for about 100 years, right? Um, As far as the Kabul reforms were concerned, they implemented to a great extent, and then they established the need uh, for a systematic set of changes to the state system. And so you find the destruction of the Joseon central government order that had been in place more or less since the early uh, part of the Joseon era and had been modified a bit after the um, Japanese invasions uh, in the 16th century. And so that was completely taken away. And what you have in place is something that we're more familiar with is a kind of modern cabinet system uh, in which you have uh, still the monarchy with a somewhat of an ambiguous role in the Kabul reforms era until the, the end of 1895. And you had a cabinet system, uh, you had deliberative powers, at first the so-called deliberative assembly, which kicked off the Kabul reforms in 1894, uh, and then later the so-called state high council, the Ajumbu, until the end of the Kabul reforms in, in late 1895. The Ajung actually stayed as a, the head deliberative body thereafter as well until the Japanese colonial takeover. But the so-called spirit of Kabul, uh, which was the term that was used at that time, lasted well past the end of the Kabul reforms themselves in, the, in late 1895. And then that came to an end because of the circumstances surrounding the assassination of uh, Queen Min in the fall of 1895. And thereafter, you have the Korean king who had been somewhat displaced from his ritualized central role in the government, wanting eventually to retake control in a more authoritative and perhaps an absolutist fashion. And that's what results in 1897 in the establishment of the so-called Tehan Jeguk, or the Great Korean Empire, which is what I call it. And that, in turn, led to another series of of government uh, reforms. Uh, And out of that emerged two major initiatives. One was a nationwide land survey, and the other one was a revamping of the household registration system. Actually, both of those were led by not the crown, but rather the central bureaucracy, which in turn in the, in the great Korean Empire era was somewhat of a junior partner of sorts because the crown retook control and established the domination over the, over the state uh, in this period of the great Korean Empire. It was the crown that really initiated the things that we most associate with that era in terms of modern changes, namely the infrastructure changes with the railroad and the streetcars, electricity, and other uh, features of what you might call a kind of techno-nationalistic or early form of techno-nationalistic developmental state. That's one of the themes that I explore in one of the chapters of the book as well, when the developmental state, which most scholarship associates with the late colonial states, might have emerged actually before the colonial period. That's what I argue for, because I look at, again, these processes of modern change over the long term, and I locate the beginnings not in the colonial period. It might have reached the peak in the colonial period, but the beginnings were in the pre-colonial period. And I think one of the reasons why one of the reasons why scholars perhaps tend to overstate the significance of the colonial period when the conceiving of the modern changes is because it seems that these major changes are associated with foreign powers' efforts to exert coercive control. Uh, and if it wasn't for the fact that you had a foreign power taking control in Korea in 1910, Uh, It would be, I think, a matter of course that you would look at the origins of many of these major changes when they actually existed, which is before the colonial period. And so what the colonial period does is it kind of sucks in the perspective of what happens not only after the takeover, but before the takeover as well. And so you tend to disregard what might have happened when the Koreans were in control of their own country uh, through their own state. And so in a sense, what I'm just trying to remind people of is that just because this happened in a far greater degree in the colonial period doesn't mean that that's 
the exclusive realm of these modern changes and that the initiatives, the original stirrings, began earlier in the pre-colonial period. So how far back should one go to see the beginning, the first steps uh, of the Korean state changing into a modern state? Should we look at 1876 with the first unequal treaty which opened forcefully Korea? Should we go back further? Well, I think that we should go back to the 1880s at least. Um, in the 1880s, there were these changes implemented even while not eliminating the existing structure of central government. On top of that central government, these new organs were established, the so-called Tongni Armun organs, based on the influence that originated from the 1876 treaty. And so following that treaty, you have within five years, government-sponsored groups, sometimes in including students, sent to China and to Japan to pick up the, the latest reforms in those two countries. And they came back and they inspired the implementation of these new organs that were established in the early 1880s, so-called Tongni Amun organs. And they, in turn, laid the basis for what ultimately came to be the comprehensive changes that eliminated the old Joseon state structure for good in 1894 through the Kabul reforms. So these 1880s organs had these new agencies geared toward, for example, new military equipment uh, and machinery development, geared toward communications and infrastructure, toward foreign languages, uh, these things that we normally could not really imagine having taken place in the early eras of the Joseon, but definitely were a reflection of the circumstances of imperialism that is consistent or at least a greater exchange with the larger world that characterized the 1880s. And so you would begin there, uh, but of course you would still emphasize the systematic origins in the Kabul reforms, because thereafter, even with the changes that impl were implemented in the so-called Great Korean Empire period, and then of course into the colonial period, or before that the protector period as well, with each step of change in terms of political control, you had uh, a further extension of the basis laid by the uh, Kabul reforms themselves. And so you have really the origins in the 1880s, and then you really have the formal beginnings of 1894, and then you have thereafter incremental and sometimes major changes uh, in state structure, extensions of state power, and the enlargement of state regulatory authority over different social sectors that you see a consistent growth in throughout the first half of the 20th century. In 1910, the Empire of Japan annexed the Korean Peninsula. After this date, can we still really talk of a Korean state, per se? Or was colonial Korea merely a part of the Japanese state, after all the governor generals were Japanese, and they followed Japanese orders? Yes, you can understand why this might present some problems from the perspective of certain scholars. You could suggest that the colonial state, even though it might have acted as a state, really was not a separate state because it might have been simply an extension of the Japanese imperial state based in the homeland of Japan. But in reality, and I think most scholars understand this as well, even though the governor general was formally appointed by the emperor and ratified by the, perhaps depending on what time you're talking about, by the Japanese prime minister, in effect, he acted uh, autonomously within Korea, uh, and the budget was ultimately controlled by the Japanese Home Ministry, but more or less a lump sum was given, uh, and often on top of that, more was given from Japan, and that was used to supplement the taxes that were collected within Korea itself by the colonial state, which also was built on top of, in addition to replacing a certain amount of the pre-existing Korean state, and when you're talking about the 1905-1910 period, you're talking about also a smaller secondary state, namely the protectorate state that was in Korea as well, catering mostly to the Japanese residents, but eventually, as time went by, taking more and more control over the Korean state itself. And so in 1910, what you have essentially is a combination of the two pre-existing states, the Korean state and the protectorate, coming together to form the basis uh, of the colonial state. And the colonial state thereafter developed on its own terms uh, through its own dynamics in response to the particularities of Korea itself. And so it was absolutely a state in the, in the modern sense or any kind of practical sense of the term. On top of all that, uh, you had a lot of uh, Koreans integrated into this colonial state. And so 
you can't just dismiss this as something that was divorced from the actual society of Korea itself. Not only was it a domineering state, but it also was a state that integrated considerably the elements of the population over which it had ruling authority. The state, the colonial state, did not have uh, independent diplomatic powers because it was a colonial state and not, uh, not, not the Japanese state. It was the extension of the Japanese state in that sense. And it didn't have a separate military, although there was a Korean military, so-called Korean military, the Chosengun, that of course enforced ultimately the, the Japanese power within Korea. Uh, but I think just because it's absent a traditional diplomatic facet and a military facet of modern states, uh, you can't just use that to dismiss the existence of a state itself. There's also the, uh, another issue that is brought into play because of the larger series of sensitivities, if you want to call it that, uh, surrounding the Japanese colonial period as a whole. And so there's this inclination to dismiss this as something that distorted the true trajectory of Korean history, or especially modern Korean history, uh, through the imposition of the Japanese rule. Um, And I can understand certainly why one could hesitate to uh, acknowledge the colonial state as a real state. But I think most scholars understand that the colonial state was far part of a colonial period that was very much in a very important aspect of modern Korea itself. And so in, in that sense, we're talking about debates within the non-Korean scholarship, or at least the American scholarship that I'm much more familiar with. Early in your book, you described that as a process, early modern state making was imperializing, civilizing and colonizing, reifying, embedded and fragmented. Could you explain what you mean by these few terms? Um, well, that's a handful of terms. I'll try to go through them one by one in a more comprehensible manner. Uh, imperializing, I mean by that term, the larger circumstances of imperialism of the late 19th and early 20th century. And so even before the imperializing force of colonial rule, you had imperialism and the different influences there from in the late 19th century as well. And those all affected the means and the ways that state reform came about. Civilizing and colonizing is in reference to uh, one of the goals of the growth of the state in the early modern period in Korea. There was always this attempt, larger attempt, to bring about changes in social behavior, cultural forms as well, through coercive powers of the state and as a means of legitimating state power and the role of particular political actors. And this also was something that preceded the colonial period, but of course it was very much at the core of the colonizing effort in a very general sense and not only in the more specific sense of state power. So that's why you have to put the civilizing and the colonizing impulses of the growth of the state in this period into the same category. Reifying, what I mean by that is that the state's attempts to regulate these social sectors in many ways brought about those social sectors into the forms that we are familiar with. And one example is public schooling. The state, by definition, is the lead actor in public schooling. Uh, But the state did more than that. They not only built these schools and tried to implement this notion of compulsory education, which was not actually realized in the colonial period, but it thereby created the sector of education as something that was under state authority. It wasn't something that people were doing on their own for their own social edification or personal edification. It was something that was directly the responsibility of the state. And so you brought about public education uh, as a definable and and tangible reality through the actions of the state to regulate those activities. So that's what I mean by uh, reifying. Uh, Embedded is in reference to what I said earlier, that is the extraordinary interaction between the state on the one hand and society on the other, uh, in which you brought about the integration of uh, many more people as the state itself grew uh, into the state bureaucracy uh, as administrators, as regulators, as technicians, as specialists of all kinds. So of course you had all this uh, in the Chosun state system, but the Chosun state system was very much restricted to certain social sectors in terms of who would play roles in the state. And as time went by in the early modern era, you have more and more different sectors of society who were brought into the state. And this was a complicated process depending on what particular period we're talking about. In the colonial period, 
for example, uh, a lot of Koreans were brought into the bureaucracy for various roles, uh, and this included some of the higher sectors of the bureaucracy as well. But there was also this discrimination against Koreans, and which slotted them into lower roles in, in, in most cases under the direction of Japanese superiors. But even that changed to a considerable extent as time went by. Finally fragmented, and what I mean by fragmented is that you had uh, not a monolith of a dominant state, but rather a state that was much lesser than the sum of its parts. And so uh, you had, for example, a central state uh, based in the capital, but in terms of the number of people in the state, in terms of the number of resources, beginning in, in the pre-colonial, but especially in the colonial period, most of the state actually was outside the capital, and most of the presence of the state in terms of the state's uh, effect on the people lay outside the capital. Oh, this makes sense because most of the people still lived outside the capital. But the greater point is that there was this administrative division between the capital and the provinces and counties on the other, on the other hand. And uh, they often developed in different ways depending on different goals. And so they had their own sets of rationalities, whether it's the capital on the one hand or whether it's the provinces and counties on the other hand. And that brought about in turn uh, different dynamics of interaction with the population. Uh, on the one hand, the counties and provinces, especially the counties and even township levels. And on the other hand, the interests of the central state, which might have fit more in more familiar ways to what we are, when we consider what is a modern state, which we think about this very domineering, kind of homogenized uh, state to order, and, and that was absolutely not the case in Korea, and probably was not the case anywhere. Uh, it was a much more fragmented is one word, you could say a little complicated, and of course, much more diverse group of uh, interests and agencies and groups of people as well. What I mean by fragmented also refers to uh, the fact that you had, you know, throughout this period from the late 19th century to the, the end of the colonial period, different states within the state. And so you had, even within a central state, uh, fragmentation along the lines of, on the one hand, the central bureaucracy in the, in the Kabul reform period, uh, as opposed to the monarchy or the crown or the royal household administration, for example, on the other. And this division between those two forces continued in the subsequent period of the Great Korean Empire when the crown actually took control and the central bureaucracy was in a subordinated role. You still had this internal fragmentation in terms of authority. Uh, and then you get to the protector period, you have the Korean state in which the monarchy plays no longer uh, an important role, but you have the central Korean state. But you have a replacement secondary state, namely the protectorate government of the Japanese. and then. Apparently, you have a unifying phenomenon when you get to the annexation, you have the emergence of the colonial state, but even within the colonial state, you have these fragmenting impulses in terms of the differences between the demands and interests of the central state, which were more of a reflection of the Japanese imperial interests. And then on the other hand, you had the provincial and local states, which were much more of a reflection of local interests and Korean uh, reactions and, and, and Korean interests as well. Uh, plus, when, as you go further along, you have internal disagreements and conflicts within the colonial state, depending on whether you're talking about a certain agency that might want to do something that's different from what the central uh, government wants to uh, implement as far as a colonial-wide policy. You have uh, judicial officers and specialists within the colonial system who disagree with or resist orders from the center, whether they come from Seoul or whether they come from Tokyo itself. And so the general impression of the colonial state as just the instrument of foreign domination is when you look beyond just that kind of easy, that facile uh, general characterization, just doesn't hold up. In a, it's, it's a much more complicated set of phenomena in the uh, colonial state as well. As you mentioned earlier, the Japanese colonial era in Korea wasn't monolithic. There were different rationalities in play. Could you tell us more about the main rationalities that came into play into the Japanese colonial era? Well, the rationalities of the Japanese colonial system were almost all extensions of rationalities and statecraft that began through the Kabul reforms and the changes taking place in the Great Korean Empire period. But of course, this reached a level of intensification and expansion 
in the colonial period that was exponentially greater uh, than in the pre-colonial period. And it's because of the coercive demands uh, for mobilization and extraction as time went on in the colonial system. Um, I break up the book into five different social sectors and there are different rationalities uh, that I engage with uh, in each of them because they are apparent not only in the colonial but also in the pre-colonial period. For example, in the chapter on the economy, I use developmentalism as the state rationalization process for uh, regulating the economy that you find throughout the world. And you, of course, find this in Korea as well. For religion, uh, I examine uh, how the authority over religion was done through a process of secularization uh, as the main uh, state rationality. And this involved also a process of deconfucianization to the extent that the pre-colonial and the pre-early modern Joseon state was a Confucian state or even it was a religious state. And that actually is very problematic and complicated and I try to deal with that. I'm not sure I succeed in doing that. And then for education as a third social sector, I look at, uh, as I mentioned earlier, public schooling as the overarching rationalization for how the state tries to regulate and even to comprehend uh, the demands of of, uh, of schooling for the citizens. And in the process, uh, I examine uh, how uh, citizenship education itself comes to be the first major subject in the curriculum, how that's reflected in the way public schooling itself is enlarged and uh, develops on its own uh, thereafter. And for public health and population, the remaining two social sectors that I examined, I, I deal considerably with these larger uh, theories involving, and mostly from Foucault, in, involving biopower and governmentality, which are two very specialized terms that I won't have to get into right now. But more or less, they talk about how the state in the modern era uh, comes to look at the people over which it tries to gain greater and greater authority over uh, as an object of control and regulation and study as well. And so, in order to regulate and order uh, and to uh, learn more about the population, uh, states as in Korea um, in the early modern era, devise different ways of registering them and classifying people according to different traits. Uh, this is something though that you find also in the Joseon state as well. Uh, I specifically examine uh, household registration uh, in which the state uh, tries to keep track of not necessarily how many people there are as much as who the people are in terms of uh, their relationships to each other. And so in, um, they usually are registered according to their family units. But this changes over time as well, especially in the early 20th century, before the colonial period and then throughout the colonial period. Uh, one of these sub-rationalities that I look at within this larger rationality of registration uh, is um, the means by which the state tries to assign surnames to people. And this is something that you find around the world in modern states, that they try to uh, differentiate people according to different means, but one of which is surnames or family names. And in the pre-colonial period, the Korean state tried to uh, assign people who did not have surnames, such as people who were uh, of slave background or Buddhist monks, for example, or others, uh, with surnames that we normally find today in Korea, Kim and Bak and those things as well, or, or certain groups of Kims and Baks and, and in Lees, for example. Uh, and those kinds of attempts continued into the colonial period and further refined. Uh, and this was also married, so to speak, with other concerns about how to deal with specific qualities of the Korean family system, which the Japanese, of course, uh, were wholly unfamiliar with. Uh, and so as bureaucrats, or at least as top administrators, this is one of the most difficult aspects of Korean society uh, that Japanese colonial rule had to face. How to deal with these family customs involving marriage, especially involving adoption and concubinage, which of course existed in Japan, but in a very different way. And so the attempt to implement this more quote unquote rationalized system from Japan uh, into Korea was something that took many, many years, many decades, uh, and it developed incrementally. And it finally culminated in this very famous or infamous order of 1940 for all Koreans to take on these Japanese-style surnames. And of course, the Koreans look at this as this 
yet another terrible example of Japanese attempts to eradicate Korean identity and all that, which I think is not the case at all. It was the case to the extent that it was part of the larger mobilization effort for the war. And so the colonial government was trying to do what the Japanese imperial government was trying to do, and that is to get everybody on board to sacrifice for the war. And for Koreans, it was to get them to identify with Japan, the Japanese emperor, the Japanese nation, so that they would sacrifice themselves for the war as soldiers or as laborers or whatever. That is true, but that was not necessarily the same as trying to just eradicate Korean identity. <laughs> More importantly, uh, I show that it was really the culmination of these efforts beginning in the 1890s of further refining the household registration system. Uh, one of the, the means by which to do that is to assign surnames or to differentiate people according to surnames. Uh, and so it was easier in the simplest terms for the Japanese colonial state to, to keep track of people if they just all took Japanese surnames. It's also easier to differentiate them because, you know, there are too many Kims and Bucks. Uh, and leaves in Korea, right? And so you can look at this on the one hand as an aspect of the intensification of state control during the wartime period, but also you can look at it as really the, the end result of a long series of changes involving registration and household registration more specifically, which also brought forth these attempts to assign uh, surnames. Can you observe any uniquely Korean Uh, rationality, or were these mostly from the outside of Korea? Well, the larger point I'm trying to make in the book is that these different forms of state rationality that emerged in Korea were more or less forms of rationality that you find in emerging modern states throughout the world. And this would make, in a sense, this a modern state. But of course, there were particularities in terms of the specific rationalities of legitimation, for example, involving the Korean king and the relationship between the Korean king and the, and the cabinet or the bureaucracy. And then you have the relationship between the Korean king and the Japanese emperor, who was the real sovereign after 1910. And then you have the rationalities involving what I said earlier, the Korean family system that were unique to Korea, of course. Um, you had the rationalities that were state rationalities that were unique to colonial systems, but that doesn't make Korea unique. There are colonial systems and colonial states and other parts of the world as well. And so, you, yes, you do have particular state rationalities in both legitimation and administration in Korea. But then I think the more important point is that these were really on a larger scale rationalities that you find in other parts of the world as well. And that's what makes it, in a sense, a clearly a modern, a very different form of state administration that you find in the Joseon era. From today's perspective, how much of these rationalization processes do we still see in South Korea and the South Korean state? Well, one of the points I'm trying to make in the book is that in systematic state administrations, you're always going to have rationalizations, uh, but they're going to differ depending on the larger goals of political control. On the other hand, you also find in the modern era, uh, generally speaking, uh, increasing state regulation and state authority and state presence in the social sectors um, and in the relationships among people uh, to a far greater extent than you had uh, in a much earlier era. So you, you have almost a linear development of greater state control. So if you extend beyond the colonial period, you obviously find in both North and South Korea these very ambitious states emerging. And you have these rationalizations that adhere to the larger goals of dictatorial control in both North and South Korea, especially a kind of military dictatorship that emerges in both North and South Korea. With liberalization in South Korea politically in the 1980s, we see that these rationalities of greater state control are taken in other directions and sometimes reversed so that it allows for greater uh, resistance and greater freedoms under state regulation, surely, but of course with more realms of life falling outside of state control. That is the result of these differences in goals that emerge with democratization, namely greater freedoms and less state domination. In North Korea, there is ultimately the almost simple goal of state control, and that is a dynastic dictatorship with all the accoutrements of, uh, of a modern state in terms of surveillance and control and punishment. And so the state of administration, without my knowing specifically, seems to reflect uh, a rationalization according to those uh, ends, uh, which of course has produced the very tragic situation in North Korea.
South Korea, again, with liberalization, you would think that that was something of the past and that it would be taken on a different direction. And so that's why the most recent developments are a bit more concerning when you see an attempt at uh, a regulation over the education sector that seems to reflect more this linear development of greater state authority and intervention, which seem to go against the broader ideals of a liberal democracy. And so I think, as always, ultimately, the state rationalizations are going to reflect the political goals. And so it's going to depend in South Korea on differences in, in political control and changes in political control as well. You initially framed your book in reaction to the point of view of Western scholars on the Korean colonial era. How about Korean academics? How do you think they will react or they have reacted uh, to your book's arguments? Um, well, that would be premised on a presumption that Korean academics will actually read my book or will find my book worthy of reading. And I hope that is the case, that it will be considered by some of my colleagues uh, in South Korea. I think probably the most surprising thing for them will be that I have zero consideration of the morality of the colonial system. Uh, not because I think that it was moral, I don't. Uh, I think colonial domination in general was a bad thing, uh, to put it in the simplest terms. But it was the reality. And so uh, my premise is that based on that reality, how do I interpret the way the colonial state uh, emerged, how it functioned? and what kind of impact it had on the lives of the people of South Korea and on how we look at modern Korean history as a whole. In that sense, uh, it would be very alien to, I think, Korean scholars to see that I do not talk about a lot uh, the modes of coercive domination. I don't talk about the military a lot, I don't talk about the police a lot, except for the way the police functioned in an instrumental role for public health and for education, even for religion. But I don't focus uh, on the means by which a foreign conquest state came to be implanted in Korea and how that uh, engendered terrible outcomes and resistance from Koreans. I do talk a lot about resistance, particularly uh, in opposition to state uh, initiatives in the education sector, uh, in religion, uh, and in public health as well. But I don't use that as a means of concluding that uh, the colonial state was a bad thing. I mean, because that, ultimately that is not an academic question that, uh, that I'm concerned with. Uh, but beyond that, I hope that the book to South Korean historians will provide an impetus to look at the longer term connections between the colonial and the pre-colonial periods and the colonial and the post-colonial periods as well and to examine this as a longer term change as a longer term process of change with a longer arc that begins really in the late Joseon era but especially in the late 19th century and uh, much of that extended into and was of course accelerated and intensified by the colonial system and some of that was of course reversed by the colonial system but in any case it was a process of change that extended many decades and that encompassed the colonial system, it wasn't necessarily equivalent to the colonial period. And that's the real major point that I want to leave behind to the leadership. Professor Huang, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. I appreciated this. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, Subscribe to our podcast on iTunes and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.